Good morning. It's funny because um, Dan's been here since he was uh, two months old, and he hasn't missed a, a Sunday. And oh, I, no, actually, although he only sleeps or cry whenever I preach, I, I still miss not having him here today. Now, this is our fifth of a seven study into the book of Revelation. Um, in our first study, we looked at Revelation 1, 1 to 8, and saw that the book is meant to be understandable so we could tell others. The message, above all, is that Jesus is the example as we live as priests of God to the world. In our second study, from Revelation 1, 9 to 3, 22, we noticed John's first vision that churches tend to have issue. The most common issue was that of compromise, and the typical compromise had little or even no moral degeneracy involved, and yet Christ seemed hugely displeased. On the other hand, those that were praised were praised for being sacrificial. In our third study, from chapter 4.1 to chapter 11.19, we saw judgments from the first seal to the sixth trumpet. We focused on why Christ would judge and saw that, above all, it's about his authority. The series of judgments, though severe, also reveals that Christ judges for the purpose of restoration. So in the midst of his judgment, there is always time for repentance. Time, or God's patience, is his mercy. God gives us time so we could change and then walk, lines, walk alongside those who need change. And last time, it, which turned out a bit mumbo-jumbo because of technical issues, we looked at the second vision from chapter 12, verse 1, through to chapter 16, 21, and saw that evil will pursue the church but God will protect the church and overcome evil. In the face of evil attack, we should be on guard against accusations and divisions and be prepared to die and live in hope in spite of persecutions. We are encouraged to be like the white rope saints, to not seek to escape from the age of evil while striving to save the lost for Christ. Today, we will be looking at 17.1 to 20.15, John's third vision, and it goes like this. 17.1 to 18.24, Babylon is judged and destroyed. 19.1 to 16, Christ is victorious. And then 21 to 6 is the millennium, and then 21, 1 to 8, new heaven and new earth. Now, one message that came out of the second vision is that God does use evil to judge evil. For example, in the fifth trumpet uses evil insects from the abyss to judge unrepentant pagans. Now, the concept of God using evil is not new. Well-known examples include what happened to Job and Joseph, and perhaps to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. We are told clearly what happened and what to learn from it. What we are not told, however, is how. For example, just exactly how the devil could appear before God and talked about Job without being destroyed since supposedly evil cannot stand in the front of God's light. And in Old Testament teaching, at least, we have never been invited to ask God how these things happened. Job never asked God. Joseph never asked God. Moses never asked God. So perhaps, and I can only say perhaps, it was prevalent in first century Christian mentality that when it comes to evil, Knowing what is enough, we are not supposed to ask how. Now, why did I give such a long disambiguation? If you have read chapter 17 and 18, 
you will know that it is very tempting to ask how, even though it is very difficult to come up with answers. Recalling that chapter 16 saw the completion of the seven bowls, supposedly the seven seals are completed and judgment is done. 17 and 18, therefore, might be the political and social outcomes or consequences of the judgments. In chapter 17, we are introduced to the prostitute, also known as Babylon. Now, Babylon, once the Chaldean capital, was a prominent city in biblical history. I stress, biblical history, not necessarily human history. In the Old Testament, Babylon was the kingdom that destroyed Judah, and it's where Daniel grew up and received his visions, some of them possibly spanning into the realms of Revelation. Humanly speaking, Babylon was prominent for less than 100 years, and even by first century standard, it was famous more for folklores than for historical significance. It fell to per Persia some 500 years before Christ. It lived on as a big city within different empires, but was no longer the heart of anything. If I have to give a modern day example, it might be cities like Nanjing, Kyoto, or St. Petersburg, right? But I have to stress, these are crude examples. In first century circle, Christian circles, however, Babylon was also used as a code name for Rome, as in the power of the Roman Empire, for example, in 1 Peter 5.13. Now, I do want to caution, though, simply reading every mention of Babylon or prostitute as Rome will not work, as we will find out shortly. Now, putting her identities aside, right, putting her identity aside, this is what happened to Babylon in chapters 17 and 18. 17, 1 to 2 describes her global influence. 3 to 8 describes her siding with the beast. 17, 9 to 14 digress to the beast and how he'll set up kingdom against Christians. 17, 15 to 18 describes how people will turn against a prostitute for the beast. Chapter 18, 1 to 3, an angel mocks the fall of Babylon. 18, 4 to 8, another voice spoke as Babylon fell. 18, 9 to 20, describes the misery of those who once followed Babylon. And then 18, 21 to 24, an angel sealed the, Bab the fate of Babylon with a final destruction. Now, I wish I had time to go through this, but I don't, so please read up on your own. That's what this third vision, following the seven letters and the admonition of, admonishment of the second vision, is that when God sets evil against evil on a full scale, let me repeat, when God sets evil against evil on a full scale, men and women would not know which side to be on, not even Christians. And we have to be repeatedly told to stand on neither side. In other words, we might not think so of ourselves, but when time gets testing, it will be revealed that we don't have a clue what good and evil looks like if not for God's warning. We won't have a clue what good and evil looks like if not for God's warning. Now, I'm sure if the concept of cool existed in the first century, right, what this message suggests is not cool, not cool at all. And I hope that this message upsets you somewhat as well. Now, I mean it. I hope that this message upsets all of us somewhat. It's not because I want to offend anyone, 
but because unless we are upset by the suggestions that we are clueless, we probably won't make any changes. And that might have been the intention for the first century readers as well. They too thought they knew something about taking sides. In fact, some of them thought they were very successful at picking the right side. Pick the right side and enjoy the ride. Sounds familiar? This mentality goes back two and a half thousand years. Let me elaborate briefly. Smyrna, remember them? Smyrna, one of the seven churches, would surely respond to this in a strong way. This city became prosperous precisely because it picked the right side. When the Romans fought the Carthages, Smyrna picked Rome and were richly rewarded when Rome won. The Smyrna Christians, on the other side, flatly refused to worship Caesar as God and were persecuted. And even their bishop was martyred. So they too knew about the cost of picking or not picking sides. Pergamum, another of the seven churches, might feel a little bit different. Pergamum was always a friend of Rome, so picking sides wasn't an issue until the worship of the emperor was installed. The locals, out of their historical friendliness, established the first temple devoted to worshipping the Roman emperor. As a result, the Pergamum Christians had to choose which side to be on. And then there was Thyatira, right, who seemingly had no choice. Their city was destroyed by earthquake and Rome funded the rebuilt. So as the Jewish synagogues were rebuilt, paid for by Rome, so were some new Roman temples alongside them. Rome scratched Thyatira's back. Now, should they scratch Rome's back in return? I don't envy being any of them. Seemingly, they were all caught between a difficult choice or death. Faced with that, how would we choose? The history I just mentioned might be remote and irrelevant to us. But they were imminent and had day-to-day -day relevance to the first century readers. And in their mind, just how might 17 and 18 come across? Now, in case you are still hung up about the prostitute and the beast, let me quickly address that in the first century context. Even back then, even back in the first century, and even if we were to discount interpretations that factored in post-first century history, there were no immediate candidates for the prostitute or the beast. In other words, it was as vague to them as it is to us. Don't take my word for it. Read up on your own. So if we weren't to use the visions to identify individual rulers, individual people, then the broader message has to be about the prominent one, which is, don't take sides. Earlier, I said that there are two parts to the lesson about not taking sides. The first being that, <clears throat> the first being that when both sides are evil, and when God sets evil against evil, we'd better not be around. That lesson, as the example of Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira has shown, is a difficult lesson. But, as, hard, but if, as if that's not hard enough, there is another aspect. And that's how the world will react as evil fights evil. Ever since the second vision began, we saw that even though the judgments are directed at evil, the events of the judgments will involve the entire world. People will respond, and from what we have seen, 
they will respond mostly with unrepentance and hostility. From 1715 on, however, we see an entirely different aspect of human nature. Putting good and evil aside, I dare say we would all struggle to identify judge which sides the people are on. Read 1715 on, which side are the people on? The prostitutes or the beasts? At first, at first, the prostitute seemed to have many of the peoples under her wings as they grew rich and arrogant with their business success. But when God turned the beast against the prostitute, again, let me stress, we don't know how God turns evil against evil, the people would sigh with the beast and destroy the prostitute. And when she is destroyed, people would mourn and mock her demise at the same time. To sum this up, people of the world will take any and every side without the need for reason. And when that happens on a scale of millions or billions, it is very disturbing and challenging for Christians to live. Let me repeat. People of the world will take any and every side without the need for reason. And when that happens on a scale of millions or billions of people, it is very disturbing and challenging for Christians to live. I would go as far as to suggest that when that happens, don't bother to judge what's happening. We wouldn't know how. That's why heaven has to shout. Heaven is shouting. Otherwise, Christians wouldn't be able to respond. So let's hear for ourselves what heaven is going to shout. Chapter 18, verses 4 to 5. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Why would heaven call God's people to get out? Why would heaven call God's people to get out? Now, if you remember the seven bowls, you might recall that they resemble the, seven pl the ten plagues of Egypt. However, during the ten plagues of Egypt, there was no risk for Israel. They were always safe. Here, why would the people be told to get out? Just now, we saw that the people switch sides cluelessly between the prostitute and the beast. The only certain thing was they weren't going to pick God's side. With the prostitutes about to be destroyed, guess where the people will have gone? And again, it seems that the Christians aren't too wise. As the masses flocked from the prostitute to the beast, Christians are bound to be caught up. And heaven cries out saying, don't. If you recall the message from the seven letters, it was as if God was more concerned with their spiritual conditions than he was about their moral conditions. Now knowing our God, he must be equally concerned. Here, however, the overwhelming emphasis is on spiritual. Why? To the first century Christians, echoes of the abandonment from God as discipline from their idolatry and adultery was still ringing. So they knew about moral goodness regardless of living up to them or not. They knew about it. Now to us, at least as 21st century urban Christians, the thought of murder or adultery is equally unacceptable. And again, regardless of whether we are living up to it or not. 
But guess what? Not only do we know it, not only does God know it, so does Satan. He knows it too. There are enough examples in the Old Testament for first century and first 21st century Christians to know that Satan is out to enslave and destroy. If he was to do it via moral failures, he would, because he gets to see life destroyed and have God mocked. But if he has to do it some other way, for example, deception, he would too, because it's just as effective in getting lives destroyed and God mocked. We saw earlier that God knows this and so does Satan. What about us? Do we know it? It seems that at best, just a little. And for sure, not so well that we could foil Satan's deception on our own. Or heaven wouldn't shout. That being the case, what can we learn and what should we change? To understand the difficulty of the situation, let's recap the situation between the prostitute and the beast. The prostitute, as we saw earlier, represents wealth and worldliness. The beast with the ten kings represents power. First, it went after Christ and his people in 1714, and failing that, turned towards the prostitute and ruined her. Now, just how these two former partners in crime became enemies is not clear, other than God making it happen. What is clear, though, is that in the aftermath, the world mourned. What we have to ask ourselves is, therefore, if the world's business and political systems were to get into a fight tomorrow, with one side destroying the other, how much mourning would we do? If the world's business system and political system gets into a fight tomorrow with one side destroying the other, how much mourning would we do? How much regret would we feel? Without the warning of Revelation 18, I would say I will probably be doing a fair bit of mourning myself. Here, heaven is saying, you have only lost what would be destroyed anyway. So snap out before more destruction comes. Snap out before more destruction comes. Can we do it? As I reflect on this, I find a huge struggle inside of me. This is like the prayer of the white robed saints we looked at last time. Even as we know what we have to do, can we do it? The white robed saints prayed for an uncompromising heart, and death was their reward for this prayer. Could we pray for an uncompromising heart, knowing that death is the result? The Christians in battle between the prostitute and the beast also need an uncompromising heart, only to let go of everything they have with no chance of preserving any of their earthly belongings. Could we pray for that, knowing that lost is the outcome? This calls for very extensive soul-searching. Just to give you an idea of how extensive it has to be, similar tests of that of the white robe saints or end-time Christians were presented before Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they all failed. This goes to show what a stronghold power and wealth has on us. And that's why heaven has to shout. This is not meant to discourage first century Christians or us. 
For at the end of chapter 19, 19, we see the beast destroyed. We are assured of victory, so in the ultimate sense, we don't have much to worry about. The process, however, or the journey, if you prefer, seems to be the greater concern of John. At the beginning of Revelation, we saw clearly that Christians were compromising because of their practical needs, posturing themselves wrongly for the sake of their business associations, Rome, or both. Here, we see people swinging cluelessly between the prostitute and the beast, not sure which side to be on, even when God turned one against the other. So guess what Christians would do when the prostitute is destroyed and Christ is preparing for his judgment on the beast? Would Christians suddenly see the light and say, Oh, we better stop, stop relying on forces of the world and side with Christ alone? You think Christians would suddenly see the light? If biblical history is anything to go by, Christians will likely side with any and everything. If you don't believe me, test ourselves. In the last week, which had more influence on us? An email from work or the Bible? Which had more influence over us? A note from our kids' principal or the Bible? And which caught our attention? Our text demand note or the Bible? The beast knows exactly which button to push and more often than not we welcome him pushing our buttons. This is not a judgmental accusation no more than the seven letters were. We are just not so different from first century Christians, that's all. And perhaps, just perhaps, that's why we find it so much more fun to study the when and the how of Revelation. Because as, sorry, as, the, yeah, because as we debate who the prostitute is, as we discuss who the ten kings might be, we can forget all about changes. But John wants us to change. Christ wants us to change. God wants us to change. That's why they wrote Revelations. And perhaps, just perhaps, that's why there is a 1,000 year gap between the destruction of the beast and the binding up of Satan and the final judgment of death and Hades. So much time is needed because many just have a nominal faith in Christ. And time is needed to either change them to maturity or to weed them out for destruction. Now, I know many of us have heard the once saved, always saved concept and feel very comfortable about that. God is faithful. He will keep his promise. But have we considered the example that a clueless, compromising faith will set for others, including our children. As they see us waver, as they see us compromising, as they see us swaying, they will be affected. And soon, we might just end up with a generation of children who knows Christ only by name, but isn't saved. Christ doesn't want that to happen. And he knows that to avoid such outcome, bold changes is needed. So heaven shouts, hoping we would listen. Now thankfully, we have chapter 20 telling us that as the beast is defeated and as Satan is bound up for a thousand years, there will be multitudes of uncompromising saints reigning with Christ. So we know that it can be done and it will be done. In chapter 21, as victory is celebrated, 
we see Jesus welcoming his people into New Jerusalem, their eternal dwelling. And guess what the first welcoming act is? 21.4 tells us that the first thing Jesus will do is to wipe away the tears of his people. Now, with the benefit of the last two visions, we can understand why. To be uncompromising, to choose isolation and death for the sake of Christ, will cause any emotionally normal person to cry. We've all cried. It's human too. But to my shame, I cannot recall a single time when I had to shed tears because of my faith. I won't ask you. Let's all reflect on this. Now, if we haven't shed much tears for our faith, is it because times are so good that we don't need to? Or is it because we spent so much time between the prostitute and the beast that we don't have to? The text of today should give us plenty to pray about. Reflect on just how much our livelihood has a hold on us. Reflect on just how much our society has a hold on us. And reflect on how we are to stop swaying between the two. And how to bring our faith into action such that those choices will make us cry. I can't tell you how far short I fall on these. Yet, I'm encouraged. Because the whole point of 21, 1 to 8, is to tell us that we can be there. We can have the faith of a white-robed saint. We can succeed where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob failed. We can because Christ is able to see us through. So as I close as I always do, on a note of discipleship and fellowship. Let's find someone in our Sunday school class, men, ladies, or young adults group, and start praying for each other on this change regularly. Let's start today. God bless.